Welcome to the Riders Block, our weekly extended look at all things sports. I'm Jenny Carlson here in the studios at the Oklahoman, joined by Cedric Golden in the studios of the Austin American Statesman. Hello, my friend. What's up, Jen? Hey, it is almost August, and that means it's almost football. So our lead segment, we got to talk about football being back, Cedric. I, I don't know about you, practices have started or they're getting ready to start pretty much at all levels. Is this the time of year that you feel like we're being teased? Like it's there, but we're not quite there and we've got to set through the preseason games and the practices and the press conferences? Or do you sort of get excited about all of that? I get excited because we're inside of a month. Now the tease is Big 12 Media Day. We yeah. go and you're like, all right, here we are. But you're still more than a month away. But we're a month away now and it's all downhill from here. Uh, people are people are excited. Uh, I'm starting to watch more NFL Network, more ESPN because I'm trying to kind of bone up on my college football and pro football info for for this big uh, trip that we're about to take. So uh, this is not a tease. This is the real deal. The next three weeks, uh, closed practices where you get to hear the coach tell you how great everybody looks, <laughs> and you have to choose whether or not you believe him. And then you have to choose whether or not you want to share it with your readership. So those are the kind of things that sports writers go through. So maybe maybe we get to see a practice or two. I hope so, because our eyes tell us stuff and we want to share that with you guys. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And obviously the, the big payoff is at the end of the month as games get started. Now we've, we've got some August games with the way the calendar is. And uh, you have that first uh, slew of Thursday, Friday games of the college football season. Uh, we'll have a Friday night game here involving Oklahoma State. It's actually at Oregon State. And then a Sunday night game involving Oklahoma. So uh, that'll all happen uh, that first weekend. I know Texas uh, games as well. But Cedric, as we think about these, uh, these upcoming seasons that we're about to watch, whether pro, high school, college, whatever the level, is there, is there anything that really sort of top of the head for you you're excited about, either a player a team, a topic, like what, what are you most excited about as we really launch into this thing? Uh, the one thing I'm most excited about uh, is Big 12. I mean, that's, that's, that pays our bills. That's where we make our money as newspapers, as journalists. And that's the most fun for us is when we get to see each other on the road at these games, Texas OU, Texas, Oklahoma State, those kind of games. And that's the fun part is watching uh, the teams, we know who the good players are, but there's always one or two guys. You're like, who's that guy? Yeah. Where did he come from? And and with the new red shirt rule, we'll get a chance to see a lot of new faces this year because coaches are just as interested as we are uh, in seeing who the step up guys are going to be. So to me, that is probably the most fun thing, along with the camaraderie, seeing our colleagues like yourself. Yeah, that's, that is a good side benefit. And, you know, you talk about guys coming out of the woodwork, and I want to hear who you think might come out of the woodwork down in your neck of the woods, but a guy that we've been hearing a lot about, and uh, he may not be a known name beyond sort of our little uh, area here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, but uh, Jordan McRae is a guy that transferred into Oklahoma State, a wide receiver from South Alabama, small uh, major college program, a senior, a wide receiver, a grad transfer, when he landed in Stillwater, I think everybody thought, "Oh, that, that's that's nice. They they gave a they gave a scholarship to a, a wide receiver because they had all these other wide receivers." Well, lo and behold, it sounds like this Jordan McRae character is going to play for the Cowboys, and we know how dynamic their offense can be. So that's a name that not many people know at this point. I think they're going to learn it as Big 12 play gets going. But Cedric, for you, anybody Longhorns, Aggies, anybody down there that you feel like. Maybe is unknown right now, but might become known in the next few months. Oh yeah, Texas has a freshman running back by the name of Jordan Whittington, a six foot one, two hundred and ten pound running back who can catch the football. He's from a three A uh, school called Quero, hmm. Quero Gobblers, and he scored six touchdowns in the Class Three A state championship game that was played at Jerry World, and he is a a monstrous talent who's already getting raves from the coaches and teammates in practices mm -hmm. and uh, no stranger to the big stage as evidenced by what he did in the state title game 
And with along with Keontae Ingram in that backfield, I think they're going to do a lot to take a lot of pressure off of Sam Ellinger, who's got the weight of expectations on his shoulders after that Sugar Bowl performance. Yeah, Texas running backs always uh, seeming to make headway, but uh, a couple Jordans that we threw out there. I don't know if there's any significance in that, but as I think about the, the NFL season, obviously their camps have already gotten underway, a lot going on there, but I'm really interested about these Big 12 quarterbacks. We see Pat Mahomes coming back after his MVP season, Baker Mayfield taking over a, a Browns team that has everybody buzzing after their off season. And then obviously you've got Kyler Murray, the number one draft pick going down to Arizona, who, you know, there was no talk about waiting to start Kyler Murray. He sounds like he's going to be the guy from day one, has already turned a lot of heads down in Phoenix. But for me, Cedric, it doesn't seem that long ago that Big 12 quarterbacks were supposed to be system quarterbacks. These guys, you know, couldn't really seem to make any headway in the NFL. Now you've got three potentially playing some pretty high profile spots with the uh, draft picks and, and obviously that MVP award for Mahomes. But, you know, I just think it's going to be fascinating to see, especially those two youngest guys, the Oklahoma guys, how do their seasons play out? But fascinating stuff all over the NFL. We'll, we'll talk about Ezekiel Elliott and his holdout here in a minute. But anybody for you, Cedric, that uh, you're, you're fascinated to see either how they play or, or can, they, uh, can they repeat something from last year? What, what's, what's NFL curiosity for you right now? My biggest curiosity, and I know I'm going outside our region, is the Pittsburgh Steelers. How on God's green earth are you talking about winning a championship without Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown? Mm -hmm. I know it was a dysfunctional locker room. I know it was toxic between Antonio Brown and Big Ben Roethlisberger. But you lose Le'Veon Bell, you lose the arguably the best wide receiver in the league, and now you're asking Juju Smith-Schuster, who had a career year, you're asking him to now be the number one receiver. And you're expecting to, to not miss a beat after going nine and six and missing the playoffs last year. I think the Steelers may be in for a rude awakening. Baker Mayfield is not scared, Jen. You know him. I know him. He doesn't play scared. The Cleveland Browns are absolutely stacked on both sides of the ball. Miles Garrett. Um, on, on the defensive end and, and great off offensive line help for Baker. You bring in Kareem Hunt, you got Nick Chubb, and, and then those two big time receivers, Odell Beckham Jr. and Jarvis Landry. I know there's two, a term called on, on paper, yeah. they're really good. I just think that there's so much talent that they can't help but win the AFC North. I think the Steelers may make the playoffs, under Mike Tomlin, they always do, except for last year. But how can you expect them to be better after losing that kind of talent? Yeah, fascinating to uh, to think about uh, who could bubble up in those divisions, who might make the playoffs, who might miss the playoffs. But we'll start to get some answers here in the next few weeks, and that is pretty exciting. So football's back. We're all excited. Hey, let's transition into segment two, and we're calling this one Hold Me Now. And, Cedric, I teased about it earlier, but – Ezekiel Elliott, the Cowboys running back, Dallas Cowboys running back, holding out right now, not reporting to camp, contract situation. First, let's talk about the serious side of this. Are you surprised by this, that, that he's holding out, that he, he's not with the Cowboys out in California, apparently in, in Mexico instead? Is there any surprise in your mind that we're at this point with Ezekiel Elliott? It's like a civil war of running backs right now. Le'Veon Bell missed a whole year last year, left $14 million on the table uh and when asked about it he goes i'm trying to change the market and what that means is i'm trying to make running backs more valuable yeah. to make the owners understand that we're carrying the ball 20 25 times a game getting hit on almost every play and you're not giving us the love at the bank you got tom brady and drew Brees and guys like that making 20 25 30 million dollars the pretty boy quarterbacks are getting the cash but the running backs aren't. And the worst thing is you can play you can play quarterback to your 35 or 36 if you're right. great. Uh, and in cases of Drew Brees and Tom Brady and Phillip Rivers, even longer. But if you're a running back, they say you're washed up at around 30. Yeah. So uh, your earning your maximum your maximum earning potential is a short window. It's a very small window. You have to try to get your money while you can. I believe Zeke's 24 or 25 years old. 
He's got two or three good years left in him, if you believe that that 30 year old height. And I think that he's doing the right thing to try to get his money right away. You see Michael Thomas uh, for the Saints just signed a massive deal, yeah. a receiver. Julio Jones is going to get his money. Where's the love for the running backs? If I'm Zeke, I, I kick back, I run a few wind sprints on the beach, I drink a couple of margaritas, and wait for Jerry to call. <laughs> Maybe we should have called this Hold My Margarita instead of uh, <laughs> Hold, <laughs> Hold Me <my> Now. <laughs> but no, I, you're, you're right about the, the money discrepancy. You know, when you see Michael Thomas, the, the Saints receiver, getting that five year, $100 million deal. Uh, right. that he just got, you know, an astronomical number. And then another $100 million was in the news recently with Adrian Peterson and his financial woes. His career earnings are to almost $100 million now, but he's been in the league for all this time, 13 years, and now just approaching $100 million. So what you say about the running back discrepancy, you know, the belief that a running back will just fall into your lap, that's, that's sort of been the, the thinking by a lot of owners when it comes to the salary. But pretty clearly the, the pounding that, that those guys take, the, the short shelf life that they have on their career, to get that, uh, to, to maximize salary is absolutely, I understand why they're doing it. And, you know, from, from Zeke's perspective, it seems like training camp has a lot of benefits to a lot of positions. I'm not sure it has a ton of benefits to running backs. You know, you want your receivers and your quarterbacks to get their timing. You want their defense to figure out uh, fits and all that sort of thing. Offensive line has to work on timing and, and blocking and all that sort of thing. But running backs, I understand it's not just hand them the ball at the opener and they'll be fine, but it's a lot less uh, in terms of you know refinement when it comes to getting ready, so I see why Zeke's doing this on a lot of levels. But um, you know, Cedric, it got me thinking about here's here he is <laughs> down in Cabo apparently while his teammates are in Oxnard, California, sweating it out. So uh, you know, if you ever had a thought of a holdout, I don't know what would you hold out for. Would you hold out for like uh, uh, Christmas or something? Yes, what would you do yeah. with your holdout? Where are you going? What you doing? Um, I'm not going anywhere if I hold out because I don't have any money. I'm going to be at home and I'm going to borrow 50 bucks from my wife and, and maybe, maybe go play some cards somewhere with my buddies or take her to the movies. Yeah, I think my I think my travel budget would allow me to get to like Ardmore. Maybe the Windstar. Maybe I could go down to Windstar Casino. The Windstar, they got craps now. I'm staying away from that place. <laughs> yeah, your fifty bucks might not last you very long, but it will be interesting to see how long Zeke holds out. You know, I, I gotta think the Cowboys they want him they want him on the field for the open, right? I mean, there's no doubt about that, is there, Cedric? No, not at all, Jen. And if and I know you're too young to remember this, but um when when they won their first two Super Bowls, and then and, and then the no the first Super Bowl they won right before that second Super Bowl, Emmitt Smith was making like four hundred and fifty grand a year, wow. and he was like the seventeenth highest paid person on his team. Wow! Or, and and unquestionably the best player on that team, and he told Jerry, "I want my money," and Jerry was like, "I'm not renegotiating." He set out the first two games, Jen. And they lost them both, including a one a rematch to the Buffalo Bills. And so uh, Troy and Michael Irvin went in and said, Jerry, got to do something. Mm -hmm. Jerry gave him and his money. The Cowboys won their second straight Super Bowl. The rest is history. Yeah. So sometimes the NFL is not like the NBA and the MLB. You got to hold out to get paid usually. In some instances, like Julio Jones, they love him so much that he knows he's going to get his money and he's in camp. Michael Thomas held out and got his money, and now he's on his way to camp. So yeah. uh, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, the passport is apparently updated, and just as long as Jerry refuses to cut a fat check, he's going to be in Cabo, and he looks he's already kind of a pudgy type. Do you really want him laying around a beach <laughs> for the next three and a half weeks? I mean, he's showing up to camp or showing up to the first game at about 250 or 260. I mean, I love Jerome Bettis, but I don't think Zeke Elliott can run like Jerome Bettis. <laughs> the, the reincarnation of the bus. Yeah, I'm not sure Jerry Jones is real interested in that either. So we'll see uh, if the holdout continues. Uh, maybe we'll have to talk more about our holdout plans. Get ready. It could be exciting. <laughs> All right, let's move on to segment three. And we're calling this one a job so easy. Maybe we could even do it, Cedric. I don't know. 
News coming out this week that Jill Ellis, the uh, coach of the U.S. women's soccer team, the Ballyhooed U.S. women's soccer team, won the, won the World Cup just a month or so ago. She is leaving the national team, and it's about a year to the Olympics, which will be the next major international competition for the uh, for the U.S. women and, and for all the national teams. And so leaving that team without a head coach as they try to figure out what's next. Um, is this a problem for U.S. women's soccer, Cedric? No, she's not playing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's like, was it a problem for, for Phil Jackson when he had Shaq and Kobe early on? Was it a problem for Steve Kerr when the Golden State Warriors are healthy? I guess no Luke, Wal problem. Luke Walton coached the Warriors there for a while, so that he worked out all right. Problem. And he only lost like one game. He's yeah. like 28 and one. Yeah. Uh, just roll the ball out there and let and let Alex Morgan and Julie Ertz and Megan Rapino just let them be them. And we got the best team in the world, men or women. And Jill Ellis said that she loves change. She's embracing the next step. She got her her money. She's got the acclaim. She could probably write a book or two, do some commentary. Maybe she's tired of the grind. But as far as the team's concerned, it's all good, Jen. Yeah. They're gonna win. Yeah, it sure seems that way. Yeah, I mean, you you look at you look at what they did in the World Cup and and what they did with a relatively new lineup. I mean, they had some familiar faces out there. Don't get me wrong, Alex Morgan. We've gotten to know her, uh, Julie Ertz, whom you mentioned, Cedric. But you know, Carly Lloyd, the 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 star of the last World Cup for the U.S. women. She comes off the bench this time and, you know, is used rather sparingly. Uh, you know, Abby Wambach, she's gone. Hope Solo, she's gone. So the fact that they took such star power off that team and yet were still as dominating as they were tells you that uh, right now the system is, you know, the, the train is moving down the tracks at high speed and Jill Ellis may be jumping off. It'll be interesting to see. Do they try to bring someone from within the program? She obviously had multiple assistant coaches. Do they promote someone uh, to, to keep the staff uh, continuity so close to the Olympics? Or do they go out and hire someone new? But I'm like you, Cedric. I just, I, this seems like it is, uh, uh, you know, all systems go even though the conductor changes. I think that it, it seems like the U.S. will still be the favorite heading into the Olympics, heading into probably any international competition that they might go into for the foreseeable future. And you mentioned Phil Jackson, you mentioned Steve Kerr. I mean, is coaching the U.S. women's soccer team, could that potentially be the easiest coaching job in all of sports? I, I mean, I guess it's not, you know, without its pitfalls and perils, but is there anything easier than that? I don't know, man. I, I know that there, every, every great team has to, the coach slash manager, has to massage some egos or whatever. But at the end of the day, talent wins. The most talented teams usually win. And if you can keep them from killing one another, like Phil was able to do with Shaq and Kobe before that thing disintegrated, great things can happen. So they've got great young players coming up. You, you mentioned Carly Lloyd, she's, six, she's 36 years old. So they were able to bring her off the bench and she can still get it. She can still play. So. Uh, I think as long as you keep having the talent that, that keeps uh, recycling itself into the program, good assistant coaches hopefully will become really good head coaches and great players will win in when it matters the most. So Olympics coming up, I got my uh, USWNT banner ready. <laughs> Uh, I'm, re I'm ready to watch these ladies get busy once again. Yeah, I got your got your scarf going. Yeah, I I think you're I think you hit on something that is absolutely the truth when it comes to jobs like this one. You know, whether it was Phil Jackson with those stars or or Steve Kerr even in more recent memory with the Warriors, and now probably as you look around the NBA, you're going to see this having to happen more often with coaches is managing multiple superstars at once. It becomes you know, part of your job is the X's and O's, but a lot of it is the psychology of the team. How's everybody getting along? How are they feeling about playing time and shot distribution? And, uh, you know, is everybody 
moving in the same direction. And, you know, I do think that there was some of that that Jill Ellis had to deal with with this U.S. women's national team that went to the World Cup. There was talk that Carly Lloyd was none too, uh, as one example, none too happy with uh, not starting with coming off the bench. And yet you never really heard or saw any of that get in the way. You know, when Megan Rapinoe's comments about the uh, White House came to light and caused such a stir, there was never a sense uh, fr coming from her teammates that that was a distraction to them or they uh, held it against Rapino in any way. So, you know, whether you agree with that or not, uh, what she said, the fact that the team was able to continue on, I mean, I think that says as much about Jill Ellis and, and coaches like her of those teams with such super dynamic stars that they have to manage the, uh, the, the people as much as the play on the field. So lots of times, you know, you're not so much dealing with what are the X's and O's as you are, you know, how's everybody, how's everybody handling this moment? And said, I don't know about you, but I mean, that, that takes a special skill set. But yet I think about, you know, the college coaches that we deal with at some of these, you know, major college programs that have to deal with recruiting and boosters and NCAA rules. And then they got to go out and win, you know, games. To me, the college level, is way more difficult because of all of the different pieces uh, than the pro level. I know, again, it's a different set of issues, but I think when you talk about hard coaching jobs and easy coaching jobs, seems to me like those college coaches, they got a lot that they got to manage. It's because of school. Yeah. Uh, the ones that actually go to class, the one, the ones, and it's the ones that don't go to class, is, is that's when the the work comes in. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to talking to Cliff Kingsbury and asking him, how's it been not having to worry about recruiting and, and classes and, and final exams and midterms and stuff like that. Now you just got to win football games. Oh, wait, I got that wrong. He didn't have to win and he still got an <laughs> NFL job. My bad. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see how that one goes. I don't know how long they'll uh, let him stay in Arizona if he doesn't win a few more games than he won at Texas Tech, but who knows? We'll see. All right, that's it for the Riders Block this week. Be sure to come back and join us again next week. More talk about football, basketball, all the sports you love. Join us then. Thanks a lot.